the people in Central Asia. However, in the late 1960s, the Soviet Union diverted two of its main tributaries to irrigate cash crops, which brought the sea salinity to toxic levels and ultimately dried out the sea altogether. Now, some 40 million people's livelihoods have been affected by this crisis, and the seabed is a desert contaminated with chemicals from fertilizers and pesticides. In recent years, there have been increasing efforts being made to find innovative new solutions to restore this landscape, including through an upcoming competition hosted by the World Bank, the Kazakh German University, my own organization, the Global Landscapes Forum, and other partners. This competition is called the Disruptive Tech Challenge, and the winners will, will receive grant money and mentorship to implement their solutions. So in the lead up to those winners being announced in early April, today we're hearing from two experts who are, have been working on restoring the basin for years and years, and we're so excited to hear from them. So we have Dr. Vadim Sokolov, a civil engineer in hydro construction who serves as the head of agency for projects implementation of the International Fund for Saving the Aral Sea. And he works on a number of related councils and partnerships focused on water security in Central Asia. We also have Dr. Christina Todorich joining us from Japan, where she works on soil water plant salinity at Totora University, and since 2006 has worked as regional coordinator for the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture for Central Asia and the Caucasus. She's focused her past 35 years on dry land ecosystem resilience and has consulted for a number of UN and other global agencies. And our two speakers know each other well from working on the Aral Sea Basin over the past decades. So um, they'll have much to say about their firsthand witness of the drying of this massive sea. Uh, so let's start with the basics. Uh, Christina, the Aral Sea, as mm -hmm. I said before, used to be one of, it used to be the world's fourth largest lake. And as I mentioned briefly, there have been some human and also environmental factors leading to its drying and massive degradation. But could you tell us more about what has led to the disappearance of this lake? Yeah, well, of course. I would like to tell you that I spent a lot of uh, my years as researcher, as also on uh, uh, as an education person uh, and also on an extension, uh, working with uh, rural communities uh, since uh, 1997. So it was my first uh, expedition mission on Aral Basin. Actually, I would like to tell you that this is a worse combination. The, the drying up of Aral Sea is a worse combination between uh, human being or human anthropogenic factors and uh, uh, environmental. So I would like to tell you that uh, geographically, what we need to be very careful because this is very sensitive and political process. We be we need to be very careful because uh, which which environmental dominated or anthropogenic uh, factor dominates. We need to find out. Of course, in different different in different periods, uh, let's say the, this um, pressure was different. Actually, the geographical and geomorphological distribution of Aral Sea, it's uh, it's uh, it's very uh, itself itself it's double locked landscape. So this Aral Sea doesn't have any entrance into the sea or other well circulating water bodies. So it seems that uh, the first time in 1990, when BCC news uh, recognized or confirmed about this uh, and uh, considered to recognize that the Aral Sea is really one of the planet worst environmental disaster. Uh, but I would like to tell you that uh, based on this, uh, we find out that uh, there are different categories of factors that leading to drying up of Arab Sea. If to see in history, back in history, so let's uh, make even going for Tetis uh, Sea. In Mesozoic, for example, all this iran turanian lowlands was a big sea. Actually, and Kazakhstan desert that now represented Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan, it was water. That it seems that increasing of aridity of climate 
desertification process for centuries was one of the key vector for changing in this area. And uh, of course, uh, I would like to tell you that uh, this area's uh, uh, later one, later one when RLC was based, actually Sirdaria, uh, Mudaria, which are two main transboundary river feeding RLC all the time, didn't reach RLC even. For example, five or so, eighty thousand years ago, these two rivers didn't reach RLC. Even Amudaria River all the time changed the stream as well. So it means that we need to be very, very carefully when we are saying which is uh, uh, the reason or the root causes of uh, shrinking of RLC basin. Actually, we have a lot of uh, factors aggravating the ecological situation today. This is why today we are in face of the crisis, of course, it's a maximum actually of this process. And maybe in some way, in some way, irreversible. And all this shrinking of Aral Sea leading to appearance of this saline Aral Kun desert. And let me to tell you that the, this tragedy of Aral Sea, I will leave for, for very, how to tell you, tragic situation in Kenya on the border with Ethiopia and Kenya. We have this big uh, Turkana lakes that it's maybe repeating the same that Aral Sea Basin. We have Urmia Lake in uh, Iran a part of uh, northern part of Caspian Sea. So we have a lot, and even in, in, in this uh, lowlands, Turanian, Iranian to, uh, lowlands, where Aral Sea was located all the time, we have a series, a series of lakes and saline depression still now. Kukayas, for example, Sarakamish, uh, uh, all this, Aydarsai, that it means for us that this, it's a, it's a very, very low, how to tell you evolutionary it's a combination of factors so human and environmental factors and i would like to tell you that uh, for example environmental factors like uh, global warming climate change and all these trends of desertification might accelerate this process of course rrc have a tragic history of uh, overuse overutilization of water for irrigation for example recently nature recognized all these uh, countries of central asia especially uzbekistan and the top 10 countries of utilization of uh, water for agriculture. So it seems that we need to be very, very careful when we uh, um, talk about the root causes of the shrinking of RLC. Of course, RLC reached this tragedy today because most of this basin is now is in, in the stage when human activity already shown us more than 60 100 percent of water use this is why we are going to think that anthropogenic factor is one of the key element but in fact we don't we don't need we need to not forget and actually i a scientist who visited rlc as i mentioned before in the last century even since 1997 and until now i continue to have several several field mission in the rlc basin and i i am mostly thinking of cycling theory so it seems that rlc has for centuries maybe five million years five thousand years ago when she, the rlc dry up and they gain return back and I am very optimistic, lady, and I will stop here giving a talk for Vadim, that I am very optimistic, lady, for the scenarios that some one day will get RLC back in the union. Maybe not initial stage, of course, we need to be also very, uh, very uh, pragmatic, but it will be some things, maybe new, new ecosystem, new, uh, maybe new, new, uh, um, new categories of uh, land water ecosystems but it will be something that we believe to see it back thank you christina that was a really comprehensive answer that touched on so many things from how we're seeing similar 
issues happening around the world in Kenya and the Caspian Sea and other saline ecosystems. You also touched on uh, where we're going with the Aral Sea Basin, how it can become a new landscape that incorporates multiple land uses. And we're gonna touch on all of that in this conversation. So thank you for going ahead and raising so many brilliant points. Um, Vadim, I do wanna ask you first, um, if you could expand a bit, uh, Christina spoke a lot about the natural causes of the drying of the Aral Sea. Um, and she touched on the human causes. I was wondering if you could expand upon the human causes and uh, uh, specifically agriculture and how agricultural land use led to the drying of the sea and why when the sea was supporting such a thriving fishing economy, why were other cash crops favored at that time that ultimately led to the degradation? Uh, okay, no, I fully agree with Christina that uh, of course uh, we have to uh, understand that RLC basin located in very arid uh, climate zone. What doesn't mean arid climate? So evaporation is very, uh, very high. Uh, for example, when RLC was uh, still alive, it was in the uh, total volume of RLC was uh, in the uh, uh, beginning of uh, 60s, uh, about one trillion of cubic kilometer of water. Evaporation from the surface of RLC was about 5% uh, uh, of total volume of the sea. So it means that uh, uh, any agriculture uh, uh, in, in Central Asia, in RLC Basin, was not possible without irrigation. Because again, this level of evaporation is uh, very, very high. And uh, uh, of course, when we started uh, to expand uh, irrigation in Central Asia, it was started in the uh, beginning of last century. And uh, at that time, it was uh, such theory that uh, nature is uh, without boundaries. So we can take from nature as much as possible for uh, welfare of people, for make uh, life of people better. and. Uh, uh, no, uh, because nobody understood that time that uh, environment also has uh, limits, <laughs> limitations. And uh, of course, uh, uh, many today blame that uh, cotton was the main reason why RLC disappeared. But again, if we will uh, look what what is the cotton for human being? Cotton is uh, not only a uh, product for textile, for our clothes, uh, uh, also for food, uh, because uh, we in Central Asia is very popular oil from the cotton seeds. But cotton also, this is the uh, product which used for uh, production of the powder. So this is uh, uh, used for weapon for uh, army. And uh, also uh, uh, you compare, for example, cotton and fish, uh, which was in the RLC. Uh, fish, uh, it was the mostly a product for uh, uh, food for local people, for uh, people around RLC uh, region. And uh, fish never created any big income for the economy itself. Cotton, it was the maybe in the uh, mid of last century, for, uh, uh, for example, for Uzbekistan, the main uh, product which bring uh, hard currency in the budget of, of the Republic. So, of course, it was uh, very more attention paid for irrigation to, to produce more cotton. And uh, uh, in the uh, 50s, uh, already scientists started to prevent that if we will continue such huge uh, expansion of irrigation, such huge industri industrial uh, uh, development in Central Asia, we will uh, break the uh, water balance for RLC and RLC will start to disappear and it, unfortunately it was happened. And uh, we started to uh, very loudly speak about the strategy only in the, maybe in the 80s, uh, last century. So, but uh, already we break the uh, water balance and uh, process started uh, how we, we uh, not returnable <laughs> back. And uh, of course, I support uh, what Christina told that she is very optimistic uh, 
But again, I am maybe not uh, so optimistic that RLC maybe will return because we need huge water bring to here. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, today uh, we cannot observe uh, source for, for this water. So, uh, but again, uh, we observe that climate changing, so maybe uh, precipitations, uh, and we already observed last uh, few years that precipitations uh, became more huge in, in Central Asia. And maybe if climate really will change it, uh, mm -hmm. every, everything is possible <laughs> in our way. I think there is also, uh, Vadim, a very good uh, interest probably in uh, water use efficiency uh, and uh, a promotion and adoption of uh, innovative uh, water saving technologies. And also we believe that there is a, a very big uh, volume of water from underground water, also all this uh, co drainage collector water that we have a huge amount. And I would like to tell you that the dry tub of RLC induce appearance of several, several, several of artificial lakes around. And uh, of course, if yes, if you find solution, if you find solution, of course, I, I search a lot of literature and I saw that all these uh, projects, of course, what it's initiated now by the, by the global uh, global landscape forum programs, JZ programs, old bank programs, both in the central in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan as well, and all these RLC basin countries. And recently, our president, president of the Republic of Uzbekistan, um, in 2018, they decided to to establish a new international innovative center for RLC basins that it will be coordinating all these projects internationally and working closely with uh, uh, RLC, international RLC uh, funds for saving RLC, led by, by Vadim. And also we have a lot of, of experience in the region. And of course, it's extremely costly, extremely costly. But we believe that, uh, of course, if nature uh, will will uh, will be very how to tell you very kind to human being uh, as it is sometimes. Why I'm saying that because we had in 2017 we had an expedition on the dry bottom of our sea, and if you're going from the Wustert Plateau and looking on the plain of the RRC, you will see a very very interesting self regeneration of flora and fauna. That means that, uh, of course, uh, and I very, very, I don't want to say about that, but now uh, there is another policy. So we need to have a really very interesting institutional framework and policy. Because if we're looking somewhere nearby, also on the plain of RRC, on the bottom of RRC, we have a lot of exploration from oil, gas, on uh, etc. So it Again, balance, as Vadim mentioned, we need to look about this balance and never forget, never forget, for example, about the flora and fauna of this region. Actually, we already lost the taiga. We are now looking for saigak. We are very, very now to, uh, in the front of, uh, of uh, losing all these wetlands. And also, if we, if we thinking very clearly how to orient it all the huge amount of uh, collector drainage water also wetlands uh, to sudochi lake the jiltar bass lake a lot of categories of lake with a good quality water let me to tell you we need to 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 think how to of course of course now RLC is without any changing it's a really a hyper saline water and it, it's itself now rlc for, for example from uzbek side it's not under impact of human being not anthropogenic impact we have very hypersaline water with a single maybe a species of artemia and actually this artemia again people are uh, 
fishing it and destroy all this balance as well for feeding of uh, this aquaculture system in the deltas. So I think that uh, if we find a very good solution to rehabilitate and to introduce series of innovative, very precising and very digitalizing agriculture in the deltas, uh, exactly. I fully agree uh, that uh, maybe future uh, and solution in uh, exactly in the uh, attraction of more more innovative approaches and more innovations in technologies to this region. And uh, you already mentioned that President of Uzbekistan in 2018 uh, during the summit of IFAS uh, announced this uh, his uh, new innovation and. He repeated this uh, on the 23rd of September last year at the General Assembly of United Nations. And he asked the uh, United Nations to, and in this year we uh, e uh, expect that uh, General Assembly of United Nations in September this year, 2021, will adopt a special resolution to support uh, initiative of Uzbek, uh, Uzbek president about uh, cl claiming of RLC as a zone of uh, ecological innovations and technologies. And I believe that exactly uh, new technologies uh, will improve and this is the proper solution for RLC. Uh, you mentioned that uh, now we started to implement uh, a lot of water saving technologies in agriculture. And maybe a uh, future solution, uh, how to save more water for environment, uh, this is maybe to transforming agriculture from field irrigation to the greenhouses because uh, productivity of greenhouses three even f f four or five times more than uh, field irrigation so i believe that uh, innovations and new technologies this is the way for future for rlc this is only an, a vector of uh, of uh, utilizing but you don't need to forget uh, to forget about that uh, uh, saline lake Actually, after the drying up of RRC, we are facing now a new uh, so-called saline uh, Aralkum desert. And believe me, to manage with salinity there, it's really very, 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 very difficult. Do you know why? Because let me to, to, to pay a little bit attention about the uh, chem chemistry of this saline of the bottom of the RLC because of course we are trying now and it is good initiative trying to make a forestation of the bottom of RLC it might be this green corridor that was initiated by the Kazakhstan part and really this uh, green belt it's one of the solution and if we succeeded if we succeeded to make this green belt from Kazakhstan into Uzbekistan and Dasha was in Turkmenistan and to mobilize, motivate the local community just to, to give them a promise or to give them some, some, some uh, inspiration for new life. So this might be one of the solutions. But let me to tell you that the salinity there is extremely high, extremely, extremely high. And now in the dry up of RLC, for example, before, or maybe in uh, 2000 years or something. So we, re we deal with secondary salinization. This is also human, human caused salinization, but it's easy to be managed. What we are facing now in the RLC, the Saralkum Saline Lakes, we are facing with this coastal salinization that for us, for even for scientists, for communities in Central Asia, is a new type of salinity, very difficult to be managed. This is why, in order to get good uh, seedling establishment, even on Saksa wall, if you're doing the afforestation of the same seeds of Saksa wall, in Samuya in Kazakhstan, Samuya in, uh, in uh, Kizilkum Desert, even in Dasha Woods, you get good uh, seedlings establishment that it's not the case in this saline Aralcom Lake. So we need to learn now new approaches, new innovations related to management, but maybe on, not only with management, but with the, we have to have more science, even more science for to understand the, how to tell you, the nature of this saline lake, or saline bottom. And why... Again, yeah. from this point of view, I would, would say that uh, there was another initiative of our Uzbek president 
Also in the autumn 2018, it was created International Center for Innovations in, in Karakal Pike, uh, yeah. which now uh, organized a few uh, scientific field stations and they try to test different technologies and different uh, plants and uh, for uh, exactly for uh, organization of these plantations on the dried bottom and uh, already uh, works which were done uh, la during last two years on the dried bottom uh, uh, already today uh, about 50 percent of uh, dried territory on Uz in Uzbekistan already uh, under the proper works for uh, forestations and uh, in December we listened a uh, very interesting information about field expedition which was organized by scientific information center uh, under the leadership of Professor Duchovny, with support from United Nations, from UNDP, uh, and from the Multitrust Fund, uh, they discovered that uh, due to uh, these uh, plantations, which already started, uh, on the dried bottom, uh, we observed uh, very interesting processes of creation of new new soils. Yes, so, yes, uh, yes. Fertility of soils now increased. Mm -hmm. In spite of what you mentioned, that they are very saline. But uh, I think that maybe in the uh, observed future, the desert will transform in some kind of step. So it's already will be, it will be good for uh, changing climate and changing all environment in this area. Actually, I would like to tell you that this is uh, even Kizilkum Desert. This is a very good step, in fact. This is not uh, Desert Sahara, of course. Yes. And also, I would like to mention about initiative of the our international platform for dryland research and education at the Totori University, and also about 11 uh, universities of Japan through JICA and through uh, Japanese Society and Technology. We are going also in close collaboration with ICAS and with uh, IFAS, of course, and with all organizations that they are trying to introduce new technologies on the uh, related to, you see, we are not going to change. Very, let me to tell you one story. If you uh, would like to ask me about the feedback from the local communities, this is very interesting point. Do you know why uh, sometimes reforms that initiated by the government is going very slow? Do you know why? I will tell you a story. For example, when I started working for IGBA, I, gave, I brought a lot of seeds, good, good germoplasm, very new germoplasm, salt and drought tolerance that might be very good for the reclamation of these saline lands. And bring, brought it to the Kazakhstan. And you can imagine when I came in one month, my seeds was in the same room, asking for him, for the farmers, very farmers were a very famous farmer. Why you are not touching my seeds? Because it might change you income, because it's seeds what uh, like you have harvesting much more than cotton. And he replied me very quick, sorry to say, 17 years, I learned very well the technology packaging of cultivation of cotton. I know how much money I contribute and how much money I'm taking back. With your seeds, we, I don't know. This means that we need to put all my our efforts in science, education, and working with the local community to motivate them to switch to the kind of saline agriculture. We call it saline agriculture, and we have a special type of uh, vegetation, we call it salt loving crops. This is a kind of halophytes that we we uh, now trying to introduce a new technology. And I would like to tell you, if you are going to recla for reclamation of saline soil in deltas of uh, Mudaria, you can't know now going only for one technology. or well, this monoculture, well, it's impossible. So we need to go to polyculture. We need to shifting agriculture to go for precising and digitalize agriculture. And also very important is to going for circular. Now we are going to suggest new technology. My, my organization, IGBA, in past and we still were collaborating with IGBA. And they are our part, also uh, co 
collaborator for Totori University and other Japanese universities, we are now going to suggest such kind of circular halophytic mixed farming. So it seems for me that we need to return to such kind of model, mini cooperatives of multi-profile purpose in order to improve the income of local communities. And we have a lot of social social instruments to do so. But I think, Vadim, you agree with me that we don't need to forget about uh, conservation of biodiversity. Of course, of course. We don't, we need to have, because tomorrow, Vadim, our children will ask us, yeah, yeah. looking. And uh, this year we will have... There is a virgin desert. We don't have a, even small piece of virgin desert there. You know that uh, last year, uh, Uzbek government adopted a special resolution for creation five big uh, natural protected zones in the RLC, around RLC. And uh, uh, UNDP, together with the Global Environment Facility, they promised to support. And this year we hope to start a big project exactly uh, to help in creation of these protected natural protected zones with a guaranteed uh, water supply to these zones uh, to organize and to, to test uh, new concept uh, land degradation neutrality. So yeah. because yeah. land degradation neutrality exactly for very saline soils uh, and uh, if you will find uh, proper instruments and proper approach to that so we can uh, guarantee that uh, water uh, biodiversity in RLC, around RLC, will be more or less stable. But for that, exactly, you very right that we need more science, we need more education, and we need uh, more strong uh, legal regulations. Because, unfortunately, environment and ecosystems today uh, not supported, uh, such as economic activities, uh, uh, business uh, environment today still uh, requires a lot of efforts uh, for uh, protection by by law. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And also, again, I would like to say very important point. We need to motivate more empowering, empowering of local community, also collective actions from local community and participatory work. I would like to tell you very good a lesson that I learned for my uh, background that we need to motivate the local community. So all funds, we need to find solution. I don't know how. So it's a asymmetry, asymmetry of funding. So we need to put more funds in the communities and the local local level, and also to make a kind of new partnership between private sector. Now with, with the Japanese on this uh, new project, also we will have soon a very big project uh, that we are going to work with private sector because private sector, he is such kind of, uh, of uh, instrument, they will not pay for nothing. They should pay for some things. But again, uh, another, I, I uh, see, I observe the uh, comments from the participants and oh. uh, uh, one very interesting it? question is about uh, Sardoba, what was happened with accident in Sardoba. Again, this is exactly about uh, your thesis that we need more professionals to involve in education and uh, uh, trainings uh, because uh, unfortunately in uh, today uh, in Uzbekistan, especially in water sector, we lost uh, a lot of professional level. So uh, Sardoba incident was, uh, this is the exactly mistakes in design, mistakes in con construction, because professionalism now is dropping. And uh, also we should think how to increase our professional level of people who are working with, and exactly with this very difficult, very comprehensive problems, uh, which are located in the RL RLC. Also one very interesting question, why we cannot use the uh, approach of uh, Mr. Kandafi about this water project, which was in the, uh, Africa, in Northern Africa. Unfortunately, uh, our observations of the uh, uh, geology of, of RLC uh, region show that, unfortunately, we don't have a huge reserves of groundwater. It's very deep, more than two kilometers, and uh, 
all uh, groundwater is very saline. So uh, unfortunately, we uh, in such conditions, which uh, maybe it's not, not not a proper solution for for now. And I would like I would like uh, Vadim because time is very short and the subject is extremely interesting. I would like to be very careful with. Uh, regarding utilization of underground water without some kind of legislation or kind the kind of institutional framework because now we are especially in the downstream of the count of the Amudaria delta we have a lot for example looking horizon region you have such such dense network of irrigation even in such a uh, network of irrigation, many people use this, uh, how to tell you, Chinese uh, uh, to pump the underground water. The same we have in Kizilkum Desert. So it's very sporadic. It is very not regulated. And of course, underground water might be one of the uh, source for accumulation of uh, debit of water that can, we can orient it to RLC, as I mentioned, but it should be very well scientifically based and very good uh, uh, managed. And another point I would like to do not forget, it's very important also, traditional knowledge collection, indigenous knowledge. As he mentioned, you see, we have a lot of local knowledge related to renewable water use. We have the Sardobo, we have Cherle, we have Clary, we have a lot of categories of uh, water harvesting. We forget completely what water harvesting uh, technologies. So there are a lot of uh, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge that it's not in place. And also we probably, Vadim, we need to initiate such kind of electronic catalog for documentation of the best practices, of the best technologies, to be in different languages. And I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Beknias from Kazakhstan team and all this Kazakh team and all the, pre the government of Kazakhstan. They were, were able to rehabilitate the small RRC. And this is not because in this landscape, if the geomorphology and landscape is a little in favor that in Uzbek side, but in, in, even in such a case, they have a very huge project for different series of dams. They have a huge uh, project for rehabilitation of fisheries, and they use a lot of innovations and a lot of new approaches for rehabilitation. All this barsakil mess, uh, for example, uh, re um, reservoir, they have a project for creation of these national parks, etc. So it's a very good initiative, very good in, uh, some expertise, and we need to learn from each other. This is why probably we need to go for Ramsar site, transboundary Ramsar site, where we can demonstrate a lot of technologies. So and that's expertise. why we always repeat that RLC is not a problem of Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan. RLC is a problem, a global problem. And uh, yes. with, sure. with involvement of uh, all global society, we can uh, find a way for solution. Yes, That's but it. it should be also, again, uh, Vadim, it should be a very good coordination about international found funds as well, in uh, coordination in sharing of database. Frankly speaking, I didn't see still now a good database with good access. So we need to have... So, now it's possible. It's possible a lot of uh, innovations, a lot of, uh, of uh, soil sensors, uh, drones, everything, uh, higher tech. Uh, EQ, uh, but again, it needs uh, more professionals, uh, more funding. Unfortunately, yes. investors not very enthusiastic to, to allocate uh, investments in this region because uh, each investor uh, want, uh, want to have a return, but environment unfortunately not always uh, created a lot of risks for a return of uh, money mm -hmm. yes and the rlc case is a case that is not feasible at one day so at least if we are seeing to rehabilitate uh, i read some some uh, some uh, literature maybe yes. more than 100 years if uh, rlc might be back yes. more than 100 years <laughs> Christina and Vadim, it's been an amazing conversation and just in the discussion between the two of you, we covered everything all the way up to funding and traditional knowledge and indigenous technologies. It's oh, maybe any questions? Listen. So please, uh, we are happy to have questions, yes, of course.
Yes, I want to make sure we get to the questions from the audience because people have many questions to put forth to you two. Uh, one such question coming from Janae Sagan. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, but uh, Janae is wondering about alternative crops to cotton and more local crops like um, mentioning quinoa, saffron, licorice. So as you're talking about greenhouses, as you're talking about different forms of agriculture than these huge plantations that have existed before, what kind of programs and educational programs are in place to um, get some different, more sustainable crops going? And what are those crops? I would like to tell you that right now, if uh, someone from Uzbekistan and from Kazakhstan and from other uh, Central Asian countries and whichever, so my international dryland research education platform, now we are developing a special curricula and I will give a series of lectures related to non-conventional crops. So I, I, am, I was the author of all these non-conventional crops, in, including quinoa that was firstly brought in the region by International Center for Biosaline Agriculture, to whom I am very grateful. Uh, I am working on amaranthus. I am working on maybe now we have initiated as ICAS International Nursery. And my my uh, tutorial university will transfer a lot of uh, uh, good non-conventional crops. We call it non-conventional crops. So it's a kind of crops transit measured to traditional crops and halophytes. So we have uh, maybe about 60, 60 uh, crops native. Some of them is native. Unfortunately, quinoa is not native, but is showing very good promising results for RLC basin. And also okay. this, so this lecture will be, it will be a curricula, it will be a series of lectures with demonstration of all technology packaging for promotion and adoption in all these countries, yes. And this is my the, subject. Uh, Gipper Saline uh, Lakes, which we have in the uh, uh, RLC area, also uh, open uh, many new uh, opportunities for, uh, for example, Dunalela, uh, Lacris, this yeah. Artemia. Artemia. So it's uh, also uh, those uh, plants and those animals can survive exactly in very saline uh, environment, <laughs> and we can mm -hmm. use this. And but actually, again, we need more, more science and more professionals. And I would like to mention that I am specialist on saline agriculture for many years, uh, and halophytes as well. I have many several books about with seven monographs and i would like to tell you that my my mind or my mentality is to live with salinity but never to fight salinity mm -hmm. yeah adapting to the conditions that you're in absolutely and branching off of that we have a question from alicia and i think this goes um across many landscapes probably where listening listeners are listening from right now um, what can be learned from the Aral Sea and what's happened there and applied to other saline landscapes like the Caspian Sea or um, landscapes in Kenya were mentioned before? Can we assume the same level of degradation is going to happen in other such landscapes? Or what can be learned from the Aral Sea and applied elsewhere right now to make sure this doesn't happen elsewhere? Uh, but again, uh, the problem is that uh, we already uh, about 40 years speaking about uh, environmental crisis around RLC, but still we don't have a regular instrumental monitoring of the real situation. What is happening on the dried bottom? What is happening with the remaining lakes? So uh, exactly uh, the main lesson that we need, again, more science. Uh, we need uh, more uh, systematization and uh, more educational and more uh, field expeditions. Unfortunately, uh, last few years we organized only a few field expeditions. Still, we don't have uh, even the map uh, of, of, the, of, of the salinization of the soils. So it's I cannot mm -hmm. understand uh, yeah. because from the beginning. Uh, it was necessary to do, but still it's there. So uh, unfortunately, people uh, not pay very serious attention. And uh, only now, uh, last maybe four or five years, we started more and more attentively and more, more 
huge uh, uh, efforts. I would like you to tell you related to Caspian Sea. Uh, Caspian Sea will not repeat RRC for sure. And do you know why? Because the Russian rivers, Volga, Irtish, and others, it's the debit of this water is much high. The climate is different. Of course, uh, Caspian Sea also was under the some some crisis and some we are in 19s. And but recently, once again, it's recover. The only what make me worried might be northern part of our Caspian Sea, especially in Iran. You know now they have this Urmia Lake that is yeah. one of the biggest one saline lake, and now it's uh, it's uh, going through kind of RLC scenarios. Of course, we can repeat the RLC scenarios in Caspia as well because the, the Kurdamir lowlands and also this coastal salinization, especially, I don't, I don't want to tell city's name, but in all this basin, of course, it's a lot of, of problems like we had in RLC basin. But from the environment point of view, from the geomorphological aspect, from the whole climatic uh, characteristics, Caspian Sea is far away from to repeat the uh, RLC. And may so, maybe it's uh, time to create some kind of international society addressing to such kind of uh, environmental crisis because ba Balhash uh, Lake now in Kazakhstan also. Yeah, can yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Sivan Lake in, in Caucasus uh, also. Uh, Chad was, Lake in Africa, Chad Lake in Africa. So, so maybe we should create some kind of uh, special international association of uh, such kind of lakes and to find uh, jointly solutions and uh, bring more, again, bring more uh, science and more uh, innovations. And exchanging, mm -hmm. exchanging yeah. everything because you see if you're going for Caspian Sea, you will deal with coastal, coastal salinization. So you should have one package of application. If you're going for Aral Sea, for example, Urmia Lake, another lake, Kenya, Turkana Lake in Kenya or Ethiopia. So you go for inland salinization or double locked countries intercontinental lakes so the approach and innovation should be different so you need to analyze a lot of work once again i mentioned that contemporary science digitalized agriculture it and all of this application is in place i think i agree completely with vadim and at the end of our conversation please gabriel you are in charge to make some conclusion, so to initiate an association internationally for these wetlands, we need to be very careful with wetlands, otherwise we lose all these corridors for, for birds, etc., etc., and also for, uh, for biodiversity, and also we should exchange our, our achievements. Maybe for a new green revolution in agriculture. <laughs> Probably no, why no, why no? So I, mm, I think that's an excellent point and some kind of body to manage these similar landscapes collectively and share knowledge across them would be absolutely needed. And you see it even in the media, their comparisons between the Caspian Sea and the Aral Sea. I mean, people are asking for exactly what you're talking about. So I think that's a really great point. Um, as our time is reaching to a close, I would like to ask both of you in 20 to 50 years from now, you've covered so many topics in this conversation. You've talked about saxaul trees and saline resistant crops. You've talked about greenhouses. You've talked about um, alternative crops such as quinoa and saffron. Everything has been covered, reservoirs, underwater. Um, so as you're looking forward to the future, the coming decades, how do you tie it all together? What is your vision for what the Aral Sea Basin can become? No, I believe that uh, in, in 50 years, uh, the people will come to this area uh, to learn not, not the ecological uh, strategy, ecological crisis, but uh, good lessons how this strategy was transformed in the uh, new developments. And uh, uh, you will see uh, big plantations of not only Saksaul, but uh, other trees because Saksaul will change the soil and it will be possible to grow um, another more suitable plantations. And of course, in 50 years, I believe 
uh, each person uh, will turn. Oh, I think his sound has briefly gone off. Yeah, Buddy? This is uh, well, Christina, would you like to chime in and then hopefully when Just Buddy I will, I put, I will uh, made, made two minutes summary. Okay. Uh, I really appreciate your initiative and I would like to tell you the face-to-face -face dialogue and debates among the scientists or, or should be continued. So I believe that all this series, we can continue more more special subject and of course as i mentioned before i i am optimistic and uh, i am a person do not fight with salinity but to live with salinity and uh, i think that we should learn a lot of lessons from kazakhstan part and to make more collaboration more partnership new partnership once again i mentioned we should involve local community and uh, to learn from local community indigenous knowledge and to make new partnership with private sector. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And also we oh. need to, to concentrate funds to the community. Just say it also directly. This is one of the key elements that people should trust us, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think hopefully we'll get Vadim back in just a moment. I don't want to close the conversation without him. So I'll put one more question to you uh, before he hopefully rejoins. And at the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned that you're optimistic. You're optimistic that the Aral Sea Basin can restore it to some um, sort of usable and fertile and biodiverse landscape. What technologies, what innovations are giving you the most optimism? The most optimism in giving me is that people now are more, more interested in, in rehabilitation and the restoration of these very fragile uh, environments. And uh, I think this is one of the key elements because once people, once community, once the international community, I mean community, I mean international, regional, local, national, and even Mahala, you know that we were president of the Republic of Uzbekistan established even several, several ministries, ministries of poverty, ministries of Mahala. That means, in my understanding, I really agree with our president that we need to change a little bit our our vision and mission, how to rehabilitate this, uh, this uh, environment and to give more credit to the local community. Because local community bearing a lot of knowledge, they are living on these mm -hmm. areas, they know that, well their problems and needs, and we international community, all including, as I mentioned, we need to listen to them and to palpate their needs and gaps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Buddy, we are just wrapping up and um, so glad you're able to rejoin us. Sorry about the brief connection loss. Um, was there any, uh, did you have any last comments you would like to say? I had just asked no, Christina again, what was giving her like the most to, optimism. I just uh, would like to repeat uh, famous uh, slogan of uh, created uh, two years ago, Multitrust Fund. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. are also gone, but people, local people still there. So still, uh, still alive and we should uh, make a lot of efforts to make their life uh, more easy and yes. more comfortable and uh, we uh, but we should not be alone the only uh, with uh, support from a global society we can uh, go forward yeah. and i completely agree mm -hmm. with him and this is my last words i think that based on a global community support understanding and expertise we can succeed it so we feel that we are not alone and also we see we are also pioneer to to transfer all our knowledge not only we learn we are learning from us we are learning from you so it should be exchange of vision exchange of expertise on the global regional and national level through community needs and gaps so thank you for this well, thank you Yes, it's been so wonderful to hear from both of you and sharing your expertise on so many topics. Uh, we could spend hours more talking about the RLC, but I think we covered so much in this conversation. We're really grateful that you both made the time. And to all of our listeners, this conversation I know is very dense, uh, so it will be available for you to listen back 
on the landscape news page. Um, my colleague can drop that in the chat box now uh, and you'll be, you'll be able to click the box and watch it on YouTube again in case you missed anything. And then um, again, April 5th, uh, the winners of the, um, the uh, technological Technological Innovation Challenge for the ARLC Basin will be announced, and that will be um, speaking to you directly what uh, Vadim and Christina have been talking about, um, picking out a few technologies that really hold promise for restoring this landscape. So uh, be sure to tune back in for that. And thank you all for joining us. Christina, Vadim, thank you again. And we so uh, look forward to discussing this more. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to close, to close, just to close.